Oh, shake a hand, give a hug, give a high five, something. Just love on somebody right now. Get out of your seat, go find somebody. Let's go to the house of the Lord. I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let's go to the house of the Lord. Well, I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank God. Come on, just let, let, let thanksgiving just erupt out of you. Say, I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. Come on, everybody, put your hands together. to hide this weary soul this vagabond well I tried with all my might I just can't win this fight I'm slowly drifting a vagabond come on everybody yeah. and just when I But to believe my doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind Oh, sing so, so long to my old friends Burning in bitterness How y'all just keep it moving Oh, cause you ain't welcome here From now till I walk the streets of gold I sing of how you save my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. Oh, oh, oh. Because you picked me up and turned me around and placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior. Because you healed my heart and you changed my name forever free. Come on, y'all. Put your hands in the air just like this. Come on. Come on. Just say this. 
Hell lost another one I am free I am free I am free Sing it out Hell lost another one I am free I am free I am Hell lost Hell lost another one I am free I am free I am free Hell lost another one I am free Hell lost Get up out of that grave, come on. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Come on. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave because you pick. Turn me around and place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior because you healed my heart and you changed my name forever free. I'm not the same. So I thank the master, I thank the savior. I thank God. <laughs> yeah, Lord. There is joy in your house, God. In your presence is fullness of joy. Father, we enter in. We enter in with thanksgiving in our hearts. We enter your gates with thanksgiving, like Psalm 100 says. He says this protocol, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Just all around the room, can we just lift up our hands to Jesus right now and just praise his name. We come into your courts with praise, Lord. We come with hearts of gratitude and thanksgiving, Lord. Father, I pray that you would remind us of all the good things you've done, Lord. I pray that, that we would bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Father, we just thank you right now. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, Lord. And Father, I don't know just whatever anybody's going through right now. I don't even Pastor Bart's sick right now. We just declare right now that the battle belongs to the Lord over every disease, over every circumstance, over every ounce of dysfunction, Lord. We just say that the battle belongs to you. The battle belongs to you. The battle is the Lord's. Vengeance is the Lord's. And like Hezekiah, I'm oh, sorry, it's actually Jehoshaphat. He said, I don't know what to do, Lord, but my eyes are on you. There are some Jehoshaphat moments in this room right now, I can feel it. You don't know what to do, but your eyes are fixed on Jesus. Your eyes are fixed on Yahweh. And I'm telling you, he's a deliverer, he will deliver you. So we're just gonna sing, we're just gonna worship our way through this morning. We're just gonna say, the battle belongs to you. One, two, three. is 
a mountain to see the mountain move and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me there's nothing to fear for I am safe with you I love this next part to say this so when I fight I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh God the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I've seen through the night oh God the battle belongs second verse and if you are for me who can be against me oh nobody Lord for Jesus there's nothing impossible for you say this when all I see are the ashes you see the The battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress. And almighty fortress, you gon' be for us. Come on, y'all. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power, almighty fortress, an almighty fortress. You gon' be for us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Shine in the shadows. You in every battle. Nothing can stand against the power.
from you, for from you are all things, and to you are all things, you deserve the glory. One more time, you are worthy, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. of the glory I worship you, I worship you, I worship you, I worship you. Come on, just lift your hands to heaven this morning. And give him glory, give him glory, give him glory. And sometimes maybe you are not used to just kind of like these long, awkward pauses in music. I want to teach you guys a Hebrew word. And I think I've said this to some of you before, but just say this. Say zamar. Say it out loud. Say zamar. It's a Hebrew word for praise. And what that means is it actually, the Hebrew root, it means to stroll about. So just imagine the old-timey minstrels with their little leers and their little thingies, their guitars or mandolins, walking around. And that, that's what they used to do in King David's day. They had this word called zamar where they would stroll around. And in fact, King David used to play the harp. And there was times, and it says in the scripture that when King Saul was tormented by an evil spirit, King David would play on his harp. And what would happen is the, the evil spirit would actually subside. And there's something to zamar, friends, that when we open our hearts up to receive melodies from the Lord, I believe that the Holy Spirit, it might sound completely out of your box, and that's okay. I don't really care about your box. <laughs> but here's the deal. The Lord speaks through music. Have you ever been, raise your hand if you've ever been moved to tears in a song before. I don't care if it's Christian or secular. There's something to melody that speaks something to our spirits. And I believe that the devil has grabbed a hold of that and perverted it in our, in our day. But guess what? It originated with God. It's, he, he started this whole thing. Music, melody, this whole thing is birthed through the Holy Spirit. God breathed. He sang. He spoke a melody over the, over the waters, and boom, here we are today. We are heaven's song. He spoke it. He sang it. He breathed. And so just, I just want us to just in this moment, just hold out your hands just like, and just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I believe, Prince, just keep playing, man. And I believe that God wants to use this melody to minister to your heart right now. So Holy Spirit, speak now. Minister to us.
presence of God that we're feeling in this place. I don't want to stop the flow, but what I want to do is pray that what you're experiencing here, what Josh is talking about, goes into a hospital room of someone who's listening right now through ICU. Billy Jean's husband is in the hospital. He had a liver surgery and he's in ICU and very critical condition. And she's playing this because she wants that same presence of God that we're feeling here. She wants him to feel that in the hospital room. So let's join together with our worship, with our praise and pray, Father, that you would just be so present in that hospital room right now. We pray that you would touch Nicholas's body. Father, we pray that you would breathe life into him right now in the name of Jesus. We pray that you would do a miracle in that hospital room. And God, that as we worship and as we praise you, that that praise would fill that hospital room and it would transform the situation. Just as King David played and the evil spirit left King Saul. Lord, I pray that, that as we worship, All evil, all sickness, all darkness has to leave in the name of Jesus in this place, in those watching at home online, in that hospital room. Darkness has to go. It has no place in the presence of God. We pray healing in the name of Jesus, healing in the homes of those who are watching, healing in this place for those who need a touch from God. Father, as we worship you, as we praise you, God, inhabit this place, fill this place, and do a miracle. Do what only you can do in Jesus' name. Amen. Colossians 3, 17, it actually says to to sing and teach one another, admonish one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So right now, God, we just agree. Friends, just all around the room, we're just going to sing a really simple melody, and we're just going to declare health right now. We declare your healing. We declare your healing, we declare your healing, in Jesus' name. Come on, sing that with me. We declare your healing, we declare your healing, we declare your healing, in Jesus' name, and we declare your Father, 
No other God can be called a friend. No other God can be called redeem. Yes, Lord. No other God's coming back again. Solomon says, it says, your name is like incense. Your name is like ointment poured forth. Your name is like perfume. So Jesus, right now, we just enter into that agreement, Lord, of the covenant that you made by your blood. Jesus, you said you will not drink of the fruit of the vine until, until that wedding day, until you return. Well, you'll have your bride that's pure and spotless 
And guess what, friends? We're a part of that bride. We're a part of that pure and spotless holy bride. Don't wait for heaven, guys, to fall in love with Jesus. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Don't wait a minute. Just free fall into his arms right now. Just love him. And I know as dudes, you know, men are kind of like, oh, that's weird. (laughs) Well, it's okay. The Bible says that we're the sons of God. So women get to be sons and guys get to be the bride. (laughs) Right? And that bride, she wears combat boots, so don't worry about it. It's all right. Father, awaken the church. Awaken us to our bridal identity, Lord. That we have come into covenant with you. That's a marriage cup, guys. When he held that cup and he broke that bread, that was a marriage vow. He said, I will marry you. I will. I will be faithful. I will wait for you. That's what Song of Solomon's all, all about. We love the fragrance of your name. We love your fragrance. Thank you, Lord. We just love you. Just put that on your lips. Say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Not just because you forgave me of my sin, but because of who you are and because of who you made me to be. Lord, I'm, I am your bride. I'm in covenant with you. We love you, Lord. We love you. I love you, God. I love you, God. I love you. Thank you that we're sealed, Lord, by your blood. Thank you that we are in covenant with you. We love your name. We love your name. We love your name. Love the fragrance of your holy name. It's like incense, it's like ointment poured forth. It's like the sweetest perfume. The name of Jesus. No other name but the name of Jesus. Mm. There's no sweeter name but the name of Jesus. Help me sing that. No sweeter name. There's no sweeter name but the name of Jesus. Mm. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. No sweeter name, no sweeter name. There's no sweeter name but the name of Jesus. (laughs) Yes. There's no sweeter name but the name of Jesus. No other name but the name. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. No sweeter name, no sweeter name, no sweeter name but the name of Jesus. Holy and anointed one, no other name but the name of Jesus. You are Emmanuel, no sweeter name but the name of Jesus. You are the Holy One, you are the Holy One, no other name but the name of Jesus. Come on, no sweeter name, oh, there's no sweeter name but the name of Jesus. You're the righteous and exalted one, no other name but the name of Jesus. Holy, holy name but the name of Jesus. Say glory to the righteous one and sing in glory to the righteous one. Glory to the righteous one. Glory, glory, glory to 
because of your goodness. You're faithful as the sunrise, faithful as the evening tide, faithful, faithful God. Friends, we're going to have some declarations right now. So stay standing just for another minute. Just reverence his presence. As we go into these, let's really believe what we're reading here. So I didn't actually know I was supposed to do declarations this morning. I walked in the back door and Lisa was like, you're still good on declarations, right? And I said, sure, (laughs) I guess I can do that. Um, And I was sitting back there during worship and God's like, yeah, you can do that. Because I empower you to do that. I give you boldness and courage, and you can do that. And he wants me to tell you guys that. Things happen. Life happens. Someone walks across your path, and God is saying, talk to that person. Pray for that person. Do this, do that. And God is telling you, I am with you, and I am telling you to do this. And you can do it because I am with you. So let's believe that, not just during declarations, but when we leave here, that God is with us and he's telling us to do those things. So let's do declarations together. At the cross, I was made a new creation, so I am no longer defined by my past. Every day I make the choice to walk in the freedom Jesus paid for me. I am adopted as royalty into God's family and help others come into a relationship with the Father. I am a joyful servant, trusted friend, and beloved child of the Lord. I walk in the resurrection power of Jesus and live a naturally supernatural life that points people to Jesus. Amen. Well, you may be seated. And we are going to um, give you an opportunity to give this morning. There's a few different ways that you can give at Inver Hills. You can give through the um, church app that we have. Uh, You can give online. You can also give in the offering plates at the back. Um, Or you can send it in the mail, which is always great, too. So I just want to thank you for your faithfulness um, in giving. And yesterday, uh, some of you were at the spaghetti dinner fundraiser that we had to raise money for the Middle East. And Tina, if you want to come up um, and just share briefly um, that there's still opportunities to give. Good morning. So yes, there are still opportunities to to give. We're really excited. Yesterday was fabulous, a great fundraiser, but we still want to give you opportunities. So in the back, we have these cute little men and women here. Thank you, Catherine. And um, on them, they have different amounts on here. So you can grab one at the end of service. You can, uh, if you'd like, give at that moment. We do have envelopes back there for you to give. You can also, we have one of these little cards. You can use your phone and scan, scan this and give, and it goes right to the church's website. Um, for you at home, you can also do that as well. Uh, go and make sure that you put, once you're online, CFA, so that it goes to the right place. So we are excited. We want to give you this opportunity. If the Lord lays something more on your heart, give what the Lord has put on your heart to give. This is a great opportunity to really partner with the Lord in sending people out and and reaching more people for the kingdom. So thank you. Thanks, Tina. You know, yesterday at our fundraiser, we raised over $4,000. So that's enough to send 8,000 people to hear about Jesus. So let's, yeah, awesome, awesome. So God, we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, to this church. God, we thank you for the funds that are being raised um, for the Middle East so that people can hear about Jesus. We thank you for this trip that's coming up, and we just pray um, your continued provision and um, support for this, Lord, so that we could bless the people in this other area and so that many people could come into your kingdom. And we just uh, thank you for the offerings that have been coming in. Thank you for your blessing to this church. We just praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
there's a lot happening at Everhills Church. Sign up to be a part of Feed My Starving Children on Wednesday, April 13th. This is a popular event, so don't wait. Meet at the church at 6.30 to carpool or see you at the Egan Warehouse at 7. Brian Fenimore classes will continue this week with School of Destiny this Thursday at 7 p.m. and prophetic training next Sunday at 5.30 p.m. We hope that you can find the time to attend this week as both classes teach us how to walk in the power and authority provided to us through Christ's death and resurrection. We invite you to come April 15th at 6 p.m. as we present a dramatic narration of the events we call Good Friday. As we look forward to celebrating the resurrection of Christ, we must first take the time to remember the tremendous sacrifice that was made at Calvary, opening the door to our salvation. We hope to see you there. A big thank you to all those who came to our Dying for Change fundraising dinner last night. Over $4,300 was raised for Change for Aid. Because of you, last night's event will help 8,600 people in the Middle East hear the gospel. Currently, we are close to $20,000 raised for CFA and still going strong. Please check out the table in the lobby or go to ihchurch.com to learn how you can help us reach our goal of $50,000. You're a rock star. I didn't know that you did that. <laughs> Those pictures last night and everything. Thank you. That's awesome. And thank you to everybody who helped. Kathy, Deb, and so many um, from the missions team, just different people for all the work that you did in putting together that fundraiser. It was incredible. So thank you for that. Well, it is hard to believe that Easter is next week already. It seems like for a while there, I was like, oh, it's so far away, and now all of a sudden it's here. So uh, Pastor Bard is out. He is recovering from being sick this week, and so we are going to get a head start on a new series that we will be doing called The Shift. So what comes to mind when you hear the word shift? Like for me, I'm on the computer a lot, so I think of, you know, the shift key or... Um, as a family pastor, uh, upstairs with the kids, and I think our kiddos are tired out from being here last night, but uh, they shift in their seats, right? They don't like to sit still all the time, so there's a lot of shifting and movement um, when you're with the kids. In fact, I think if they could sit on their head and listen to me talk, they would be perfectly fine with that or up on top of the climbing wall. Um, one of them will sit kind of like a pretzel in her chair, and I still don't know how she does it, but she... She's a little pretzel, totally. Um, shift also makes me think of my 16-year-old daughter, who's going to be getting her license soon, and remembering that first time of teaching her how to shift gears. Uh, if you know anyone who works at a factory, or maybe you've had a, a job where you work a certain shift, okay? Uh, how about ever been out on a lake where there's sailboats? Yeah, we've been out on White Bear Lake fishing. In fact, I remember being out there and a sailboat came so close because it wasn't shifting when it needed to that it almost ran over our fishing line. And we were like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> but you have to shift with the winds. Um, shift can refer to a lot of different things. Uh, it's a change in direction. And it can be a change in an attitude or a judgment, like a change in mindset. And it's this shift or change that we're going to be looking at today and throughout this series. So there are different factors that can cause a shift or change. Um, circumstances can cause you to see things differently. When you spend time with someone, that can cause a change. Or events can impact, um, impact you and cause you to change how you think. Things like getting married, uh, the death of a loved one, having a baby, moving, all of these can impact how you live and how you choose to act. Like, I remember when we got a dog, and we don't have our dog anymore. He passed away a few years ago. But uh, when he was a puppy, it was a change in mindset because we had freedom to kind of come and go when we wanted to, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, we've got this little creature that we're responsible for and we have to take care of, and now we can't just come and go. We need to be responsible for, for this, this pet that we have. And so it shifted how we viewed things and how we looked at life. So, of course, as believers, God and his word should be a big part of what impacts us and causes us to shift. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, 
And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So Steve and Wendy Backlund have a teaching that states, change your beliefs, change your circumstances. And in it, they say that developing a lifestyle of uncovering lies that have become strongholds in your life and replacing them with God's truth about those circumstances is one of the most valuable processes you will ever invest in. The first question most of us ask when something isn't working is, what am I doing wrong? Right? That's the question that comes to mind. But the bigger question we should be asking ourselves is, what am I believing when I'm doing it? Is there a lie that I'm believing, maybe a negative life command that I learned that is affecting my behavior and keeping me from the desired result? And because of that, is there a shift that needs to happen? It's Palm Sunday, right? We're going to take a look at the story and the events around it and see some shifts in thinking the disciples had to make as they headed into the Passover celebration. So let's pray. God, we thank you for all that you're doing here. We thank you for your presence here this morning. And I just pray that you give me the words to speak and that you would open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you could turn with me to Matthew chapter 21, if you have your Bible or if you have your app, go ahead and pull that up and we'll also have it on the screen for you as well. Matthew 21, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 11. And as you're turning turning there, looking it up. Um, The shift we're going to see in this first week of the series is seeing Jesus as a servant king, which is kind of an oxymoron, you know, like jumbo shrimp. But a servant king doesn't really seem to go together. Uh, Normally, a king would not be a servant, but he would be known as a conqueror. He's the big kahuna, the guy in charge, right? Uh, People fear him. In Esther, we learn that if he doesn't extend his scepter to you when you come to him, you could be put to death. Right? People feared the king. Many leaders ruled as dictators, putting demands and restrictions on their people, trying to control them by using fear, by using acts of terror. Sound familiar? Right? If we look at our current events, we can see this being played out. There are leaders that are horrible, that want to control and hurt and fill people with fear to try to get what they want. But we are looking at a completely different kind of king in Jesus. So in Matthew 21, Jesus had just spent some time in Bethany at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And people had heard about this incredible miracle and were flocking to see Jesus. And so in Matthew 21, it says, Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, and they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Can you imagine what it must have been like? And Macy, if you want to get that clip ready. People have heard about miracles that Jesus has done and how he's even raised someone from the dead. And they want to go out and see who this Jesus is. They're longing for freedom from the Roman government. Is this guy going to overthrow it? Will he be the new king? They're looking for help. 
Um, and we're going to show a clip from Superbook, which our kids watch um, on Sundays, because it doesn't just help kids to see a visual. It helps us as grown-ups, too, to get a quick little visual of what that can look like. And I also really like how it shows how Judas may have thought or what he may have said on what we know as Palm Sunday. So, are you guys having luck back there? Need another minute? All right. So as they're getting that ready, you just give me a nod once it's ready to go. Um, seeing the clip will help you think about what, you, what may have been going through the disciples' minds, things that maybe needed to shift. Uh, and first of all, it's going to be a shift in kingdoms, okay, as we look at this whole idea of shift. And they've actually just about got it here. So before I go any further, um, it's at clip, but at 112, I believe, is where you need to get to. We good? All right, here we go. Judas, this is amazing! They should be making more noise. This is their soon-to-be king! And Jesus shouldn't be riding a donkey. A king rides a stallion. This isn't what we need. If he's going to be king, he needs to start behaving as a king. He is stirring up the people, making an entrance like this. Hmm. I've seen worse crowds. Notice they wave palm branches, the symbol for a conquering hero. Is Rome ready to have Jesus the Conqueror replace Caesar? Jesus of Nazareth! You should calm this crowd at once. You are creating a public nuisance. I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones themselves would immediately cry out. All right, you can stop the clip. So it just helps to see a little visual of what may have been going on that day in the disciples' minds. You know, they're not yelling loud enough. They're not shouting loud enough. They're not doing what they should do. He needs to be a better kind of king. Um, what was going through their heads? So the first shift that Jesus shows us is a shift in kingdoms. And Jesus often referred to the kingdom of God. In fact, it's mentioned over 70 times in the New Testament, 30 in Matthew alone. Jesus was always giving parables about the kingdom of God and what it was like. He was trying to teach his disciples, there's another kingdom that you should be concerned with. In John 18, 36, when Jesus was on trial before Pilate, he tells him, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the people were shouting, Hosanna, which literally means save now. They're shouting out, save us, save us. They were looking for a king, someone to free them from Roman government. Could this miracle man be the one to help them, to fix their current situation, to fix their kingdom? Would he conquer their enemies? But Jesus was a different kind of king, and he was concerned with another kingdom and with a plan to bring peace. It says the people waved palm branches. And this, this was a symbol of rejoicing to the Jews. Um, to the Romans, it would signify also victory. Uh, they actually, even on Roman coins, they had palm branches on the coins. Uh, and people would wave these, wave the palm branches, when a king returned to his kingdom. So it was a sign to them of victory for the Jews rejoicing. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, um, he didn't choose a stallion or a war horse. But he chose the donkey, which seems an unlikely choice for a king. A stallion would be more symbolic of a conqueror, of a warrior. But a donkey was symbolic of peace. And it was a fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9 and 10, part of which was quoted by Matthew. In Zechariah it says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. 
I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle, and your king will bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. This is 500 years, over 500 years before Jesus went through on Palm Sunday. And the imagery here is all about really an end to war, removing battle chariots, destroying those weapons, bringing peace. And here's the shift. The one who would conquer death, hell, and the grave is known as the Prince of Peace. Yet when he's arrested just a few days before his triumphal entrance into Jerusalem, they come at him, right, with swords and with clubs, and Jesus asks them, am I some kind of dangerous revolutionary that you come at me with swords and clubs to arrest me? In fact, one of the disciples, Peter, cuts off the ear of the priest, the high priest's slave, and Jesus has to tell him to put the sword away. See, at any moment, Jesus could have gotten the protection from the Father. And he could have put an end to all of that. He could have had angels there in a second doing whatever he needed done. But he acted in peace to fulfill what the scriptures had spoken about him. And the disciples may have been thinking, this is it. This is our moment. I'm pulling out my sword. We're going to defeat these soldiers. Jesus is going to come into power. This is what we've been waiting for. He's going to fix our kingdom But Jesus had a different plan. His kingdom was not of this world. He had entered Jerusalem as a humble servant of God on a donkey, not as a warrior king to conquer. When you know which kingdom you're truly a part of, it helps you bring peace into a situation. It's so easy to get consumed with our own world, trying to build our own kingdom, trying to acquire things, trying to move up in our careers. It's so easy to get sucked into that and get consumed with that. Kind of like trying to keep up with the Joneses or the Jonases, if you saw the Super Super Bowl commercial. Did you guys see that? Tommy Lee Jones is driving a truck and then another Jones pulls up and then one of the Jonas brothers pulls up and is like, Jonases. (laughs) Um, We're trying to keep up sometimes and How's that working for you? Because we're not to be about building a kingdom here. We're about God's kingdom. And when you focus on your own kingdom, it doesn't usually bring you peace. It brings you striving. It brings you stress. It can bring fear because you're trying so hard to get these things when it's not what it's supposed to be all about. Jesus said we're to pray to the Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So whose kingdom are you concerned with? Are you consumed by current events or are you keeping the big picture in mind? Because there's a lot of nasty going on in the world right now and it can be so easy to get sucked in. But we have to remember we are not of this world and we are to be in the world and we are to be fighting for peace, you know, pushing for peace and trying to help in situations and speak forth what God would want spoken. But we also need to keep the big picture in mind that we're a part of another kingdom, not the things of this world. And Jesus was about his father's business. It didn't matter what was going on in government and those other things. He was about his father's business. He kept that one thing in mind, that focus of doing what God wanted him to do. And are we doing that? Jesus always told his disciples he was doing what the father said, doing what he saw the father do. His mind was on that kingdom. And it's a shift, a shift for the disciples, a shift for us. There's also a shift to servanthood. See, Jesus was a servant king, and he was our example of humility. We were talking about this in kids' church last week and trying to describe what humble is um, with the kids. It's not being proud or haughty, but we talked about, can you imagine if Jesus wasn't humble, what that would have looked like? Like Jesus be like, yeah, did you see that? I just healed that blind man. Now he can see I'm so amazing. (laughs) You know, walking around with his nose up. Guys, come on. Come on. This was good, wasn't it? I did a good job here. You know, in fact, I'm I'm a little sore and tired out from all this ministry. Could somebody just, why don't you, Peter, come over here and give me back rub. And, you know, John, you rub my feet. You know, they're sore from all this walking. And somebody can, you know, wave branches and feed me grapes. And I'm just going to kick back here. And because I've been working hard for the kingdom. (laughs) that Jesus wasn't like that it's laughable to think of Jesus being that way he was a servant he was humble and he taught us that there's a shift from being the greatest 
to be the greatest, you must be the least, which doesn't make sense to us. It's like he did, did and said so many things that were like upside down, you know, or turned around from what we would normally think. To be great, you have to be least. And we're taught in trying to be the best, you know, some people, they'll do whatever it takes to try to get to the top, even if it means crushing other people along the way. I've, I've seen it happen. We live in a society that looks out for number one. And in fact, the disciples were arguing about that very thing on the way to Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, had asked if they could sit at places of honor next to him in his kingdom. And she didn't even know what she was asking because she didn't know that Jesus was of another kingdom and that by asking for one of her sons to sit at his left hand, that would be actually sitting on God the Father, right? I mean, she just didn't even realize what she was asking. But the other disciples found out about this, and boy, they got mad. I mean, it's like people, kids and the family, everything's got to try to be equal, you know. I mean, the disciples, they were feeling that, and they were, they were upset, and they were arguing about who would be the greatest. So I just want to read a couple verses, Matthew 20, 25 through 28. It says, But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for for many. Jesus rode into Jerusalem being celebrated as king, but he was not the kind of king they were expecting The disciples may have been hoping he'd overthrow the government, that there would be positions of honor and power and authority for them, that he would rule and reign there. And I was talking with Pastor Bart about this yesterday, and he was saying, you know, finally these guys, the disciples, had been noticed. They'd been called out from the crowd to follow Jesus. They had a rabbi to train under and learn from, and this could be their moment to be somebody, to be noticed, to have respect, to have power. Jesus was going to overthrow a kingdom, and he would have all honor and power and authority, but it wasn't going to look like what they expected, and it would not come how they may have imagined. It would be over the rulers and principalities and powers of darkness, and he would be seated at the right hand of the Father, and he would triumph over death, hell, and the grave, but not reign there physically in Jerusalem with them in that moment. In this journey to Jerusalem and ultimately to the cross, he was teaching his disciples that a shift needed to happen, that in order to become the greatest, you must become the least. In looking up um, the definition of humble, I came across a a quote. I don't recall who said it, um, but it was, to be humble is not to think less of oneself, but to think of oneself less. Okay, you can be a very strong person and be very confident and secure in who you are and still be humble. I'm going to have Josh shared something in rally today that so perfectly fits in with this. Josh. Yeah, guys, it's kind of cool. Just confirmation because um, just something that I'm really gripped on right now is one of my favorite scriptures is Matthew 11:28. You guys know this one where Jesus says, come to me. All you are heavy laden and burdened and I will give you rest for your souls. You guys know this verse? Then it says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. As a rabbi, that's what a, a rabbi does. Is he gives a yoke. It's, it's, I want you to yoke up to my teaching. But then he says, because I am humble and gentle and lowly and meek in heart. My burden's light. That, that, the, the, the whole language. But guys, it's the one place in the New Testament where Jesus actually talks about his heart. He says, I am gentle, I am lowly, I am humble in heart. You guys, this is the king of glory we're talking about. This is the son of man that's prophesied about in the book of Daniel. That's coming on the clouds, Revelation 1. Like this is Jesus, of the king of kings and lord of lords. And he says, my heart is lowly. I'm gentle in heart, I'm lowly in heart. Isn't that cool? Awesome, thank you. You can be powerful and be humble. Right? You can have self-confidence and be humble. Jesus role modeled that. He was the king of kings and lord of lords, but he was a servant. He humbled himself. In case the disciples didn't fully get it, Jesus gave them a powerful example on the night that he would be betrayed. In John 13, before they sit down for the Passover celebration, 
um, for the Last Supper, Jesus took off his robe and he wrapped a towel around his waist and he poured water into a basin and he washed the disciples' feet. And this was a task usually saved for the lowest servant. I mean, you don't want to be washing people's stinky feet when they have sandals and they're walking out in that sand and camel poop and all the stuff that's out there, you know, <laughs> not, the, not the best job in the world, but Jesus humbled himself. Um, and in fact, as he's going to wash their feet, Peter protests, you know, which is really pride. He's like, you're not washing my feet, Jesus. And Jesus says, unless I do this, you have no part of me. And then Peter's like, oh, well, then wash my hands and wash my head, you know. And Jesus is like, okay, we're washing your feet. But I'm doing this as an example. So in John 13, 12 through 17, it says, After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? I bet Jesus wondered that a lot with his disciples. Do you understand what I'm doing here? (laughs) He says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. It was such a beautiful act of service and humility that Jesus did for his disciples and an incredible example um, to us of what it means to show honor and to show service to others, what it means to be a servant. And finally, there's a shift, another shift that takes place Uh, on the way to Jerusalem, and it's a shift to selfless love. Now, we're living in an era that talks about self-love, not selfless love, right? Society has kind of taken 1 Corinthians 13 and adjusted it a bit. So that it's like, love is kind to me. Love is patient to me. And they don't really think about, oh, wait, I'm I'm supposed to be that to other people, too, They're just like, love me, be kind to me. You should be patient for me because I have things that I need to get, and so you should be patient. (laughs) They don't have any clue about showing that same kind of love and compassion to someone else. In fact, uh, about a year ago, we went to the Mall of America, which is not always my favorite place to go, but uh, we were going to try to do just some springtime shopping or something. And I'm with the girls in one of the stores, and uh, we're waiting in line, and I think, you know, there was supposed to be the whole six feet apart thing going on and they had two registers going and and someone in the back of the line is starting to get a little upset and I'm not wanting to turn around and like stare but I was just like oh I could just feel the atmosphere shifting in a really not good way and all of a sudden this lady is going off and she is yelling at this person who asked her to move forward or something and she is just going crazy and You know, I have this thought, like, does anyone behind me have a gun? I mean, it's scary, but it's the times we live in, and it was escalating so fast, and I knew the cashier was getting security. And I remember Macy kind of went off to one spot, and I remember telling Allie, like, yeah, go go over by your sister. Just get away from this, and I'm just going to try to wait and see, and I'm going to be praying. And and so I just kept praying, peace, 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 you know, because the cashier was flustered. But this is the kind of world that we're living in where people are so consumed with their self. You're not going to tell me to move ahead of foot. I'm standing right here, and I'm on the phone. You're bugging me. I mean, she just, it was like, whoa, don't tell her what to do. <laughs> But we get so consumed with self, and Jesus showed a different way. He showed selfless love. And there was something that happened as Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem. Just before Palm Sunday, that so beautifully exhibited that shift in John 12, uh, 1 through 7. I'm just going to read it real quick here. If I can flip the page. So six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. And Jesus replied, Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. 
Mary showed an act of such extravagant love to Jesus. She poured this perfumed oil on his feet. And the essence of nard had to come from India. So it would have been imported, which was very expensive. Like it said, a year's wages. And the jar was sealed on the journey so none of it would spill out. Uh, so in order to use it, you would have to break the jar. So it's kind of like a one-time use, right? You crack it open, you pour it out. But Mary thought Jesus was important enough to pour it out. And she wiped his feet with her hair. And there's a whole message in that story. But what she did there was such a humble and loving act of worship to the king. And yet Judas was angry and said it was a waste because he hadn't made that shift in mindset. He was still thinking about himself and what he could have gotten. Mary knew, Mary knew she had made that shift and she poured it out to the Lord. There was a prayer class um, some of us have been going through and, and there was a message on Mary and Martha and some of the women watched it Wednesday night. But he says in there, every one of us has an alabaster flask that we can pour out at the feet of Jesus. And it is our life, right? Matthew 16, 25, Jesus says, if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. It is a shift to think that in surrendering, we can have victory, right? That doesn't make sense to surrender you receive victory. But that's exactly what Jesus demonstrated. When he was in the garden, he prayed, not my will, but yours be done. He surrendered his will to the Father. He laid down his life, knowing that to lose it was to gain everything. The Bible says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He is the ultimate example of selfless love. And he calls us to love with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and strength. And are we doing that? Are you able to pour out your heart to the Father? Or are you holding something back? Do you love others well or is there still a little too much self-love in there? Um, so today... We're celebrating Palm Sunday, and Josh, if you want to come forward to play. Jesus rode into Jerusalem as a humble servant king, right? He was bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, showing us that to be the greatest, you must become the least. And within a few days from his triumphal entry, he would show the ultimate act of selfless love. And so the question is, what needs to shift in your heart today? Okay, maybe you've been really consumed by the things of this world. Maybe you're just really focused on things that you want, your kingdom, you know, and you're forgetting that there's another kingdom that we're supposed to be a part of, that we're supposed to be about our father's business. Maybe it's a push to serve. Maybe it's just really hard for you to have that that servant's heart, or it's a struggle. I'm telling you, at this church, we have so many servants, so many people who serve and love so well. But ask yourself, God, is, is there something else that you want for me? Maybe it's just that he wants your worship, your life poured out to him. You know, to take a break from, from so much doing and just be at his feet and say, God, I just want you. I just want you. I give you all my heart. So stand with me this morning. And God, we do that. We give you our hearts this morning. God, we thank you for the example that you gave us in Jesus. Jesus, that you were a servant king, that you showed us a better way, that in order to be greatest, we must become least. In order to have our life, we must lose it. We must surrender everything at your feet in order to find victory. God, whatever that next step is that we need to take this morning, God, whatever that shift is that needs to happen in our hearts, would you do that in us this morning? God, may we lay down whatever needs to be laid down. If it's our pride, may we lay down our pride before you. God, if it's our striving, trying to do things in our own strength, we lay it down before you. We humble ourselves before you, knowing that's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength to surrender to the King of kings and Lord of lords who lay down his life for us so that we could truly live. 
God, as we go into this whole week of Easter and looking back and reflecting on what Jesus did, make it so real in our hearts. Make it so real to us. And help us to remember to share the love, share that light with others that we come into connection with. Because there's a lost and hurting world that needs to know the love of Jesus. They need to know that you're real. They need to see it role modeled in how we live. So help us to be your hands and feet and to demonstrate that same servant heart, that same selfless love to others. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like prayer this morning, I'm going to ask members of the prayer team to come forward. They're happy to pray with you. Uh, Remember, we have the uh, missions fundraiser at the back when you go out. If you would like.